For the past several decades, major U.S. companies have benefited from the manufacturing model of California designed and Asia assembled. Of course, not only American companies, but before the pandemic, global companies had established worldwide supply chains in order to keep production costs low and inventory investment at a minimum. As a result, China has become the world's largest exporter, increasing its share of labor-intensive exports from 13.9% in 2000 to 26.9% in 2018. To remain competitive, China has been keeping wages in the manufacturing industry intentionally low. However, the pandemic has prompted the business community to rethink their supply chains and the need to shift their practices so they can secure the supply of critical components. Maybe many have hopes that when the pandemic ends, everything will return to the way it was before. To be frank, this is naive. But before exploring this topic, let's look at an example reported by Reuters. It captures the current predicament of many American companies well, the ones that rely on the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP. The mobile gaming controllers produced by T2M that include the only full-size device designed to work with a hard wire on an Apple iPhone are sold by Best Buy and other big box stores such as Walmart and Target and on Amazon. The cost savings of having things made in China are being eaten up by the costs of shipping um, from China. Townley, CEO of T2M, doesn't own a factory. Instead, like countless other consumer product companies, he designs the devices and has them made by a Chinese plant. We, we do the design work here um, and with a team in Taipei. Um, we create the tool that does the plastic, we create the, the PCB, and all of this is assembled in various different contract manufacturers um, in Southeast Asia, and then it comes to one point um, in uh, just, just north of Shenzhen, where it's final assembled and packaged. Um, it's then put onto pallets, uh, loaded into containers, and then it is shipped via Hong Kong um, direct here. He has a China-based employee, Breeze Feng, the company's senior structural engineer, keeping an eye on production at that factory into the goods are packed into containers to be trucked to Hong Kong for shipping to the U.S. West Coast. Feng said the crisis hit a boiling point in June, just as they were going to push to get goods to the U.S. in time for the year-end holidays. The company has booked slots on ships. We went to pick up the containers three times but failed. They have ships and cabins, but they didn't have a container to load our goods. So there was no way they could ship. Fang said it felt as though conditions were easing a bit by October. But now, after the new strain has appeared, we're actually still worried about whether you will go back to the situation as before. It's impossible to get containers, and once you've got the containers, it's impossible to get the drivers, and once you've got the drivers, it's impossible to get things scheduled and timed and, and what have you. So logistics has been um, something we've never experienced before. T2M ships about one or two containers a month, each holding up to 40,000 controllers, and Townley closely tracks their progress. In the past, Townley would ship them to Boston via the Panama Canal, a more direct and less expensive route that had become harder to access as poor traffic snarled. Now his procedure is to ship goods to Los Angeles. The number of container ships idling off Los Angeles, America's busiest port complex, has hit record highs, while growing piles of empty containers crowd the docks. And then Townley's containers are put on a train to Newark, New Jersey, which is their official port of entry for U.S. Customs. From there, a truck brings his boxes to his warehouse outside Boston. Workers at the warehouse then separate out the items and ship them onto distribution centers for the big retailers on trucks. Fraser Townley eyes two gaping holes in one side of a pallet one of his workers just pulled out of the orange Haypeg Lloyd shipping container that arrived at his warehouse in Pembroke, Massachusetts from China one recent chilly morning. The damage could have happened anywhere along the near 11,000 mile trek. Yet Townley is grateful to have his products arrive at all. He now pays about 18000 to ship one container from China to his warehouse, compared to 3500 at this time in the year, 2020. Uh, this time last year, I remember being extremely upset that I was being charged 
somewhere between three and a half thousand dollars for a 40 foot container to get here. Um, now, uh, if they ask you for 20,000, you ask where, where do I sign, where do I pay? Uh, it's, it's crazy. So for sure, we're looking at more effective ways of bringing the goods into, um, into the United States. Uh, one of the ideas we're thinking of is what they call SKD, semi-knockdown, where the goods are manufactured, but they're not assembled. Um, in Asia, we bring them. We can we can compact more goods, so we can get three times the goods onto a 40-foot container, um, and then we'll assemble them here. The T2M's factory is located in Dongguang, city of Guangdong Province. On December 14th, 2021, the entire city was locked down due to an outbreak in one of the towns. <laughs> Almost at the same time, Dong Guang started a citywide nucleic acid test. In China, an outbreak in a local area would seriously disrupt the labor-intensive manufacturing industry due to the strict COVID-0 policy. Workers aren't allowed to go to work, and drivers can't move goods to ports, which are sometimes locked down as well. When ports are reopened, there is a huge backlog of the containers, as they have exceeded the port's regular capacity. Shipping rates around the world have increased dramatically. Prices for shipping 44 containers from China to the U.S. are now an average of 348% higher than they were before the outbreak. The backlog of container ships from Asia has resulted in a massive buildup of containers at U.S. ports, particularly in California. If the pandemic is taken out of the equation, will the global supply chain return to what it was before? It's unlikely, because there have been some big changes in the global situation. After more than 40 years of so-called reform and opening up, the CCP has encountered a major reversal in China-U.S. relations, which has led to a succession of difficult events. Now it seems that Red China is more inclined to close its doors and impose stricter controls on all fronts. For example, on November 1, 2021, the Personal Information Protection Law in China came into effect. It aims to tighten government controls on how domestic and foreign organizations collect and export Chinese data. Subsequently, sources told Reuters that while the regulations don't contain specific guidelines on shipping data, some domestic suppliers in China have stopped providing information to foreign companies as a direct result of the new rules. And foreign companies have relied on such data to help optimize logistics, making critical decisions about shipping routes. SOLAS, or the International Convention for the Safety of Life at Sea, established by the International Maritime Organization, requires ships sailing in international waters with a gross tonnage of 300 or more, and all passenger ships regardless of tonnage, to be equipped with an AIS, or Automatic Identification System, to provide the ship's position. AIS transmits signals continuously and relies on satellites to receive signals at intervals of approximately every 90 minutes. AIS ground-based stations track ships in real time and receive signals from ship transponders every 30 to 45 seconds for ships sailing near shore. Real-time information from AIS ground-based stations is required for heavily congested areas or areas that require frequent updates. According to Vessels Value, a market intelligence and valuation provider, ground-based shipping data for all Chinese waters decreased by approximately 90% from October 28th to November 15th, 2021. In response to the massive disappearance of AIS ship signals, Chinese official media argued that China had vigorously raided and seized more than 700 illegal AIS base station devices, intercepted more than 10,000 gigabytes of outgoing maritime data, and promptly cut off the data leakage pipeline. An official with the Guangdong Maritime Bureau told Reuters that AIS rules were set by the department's headquarters in Beijing. An employee at Elaine Incorporated, a Beijing-based company with an AIS data platform of about 2.5 million users, told Reuters that the company recently stopped all dealings with foreign entities. The change occurred in October and it now only provides data to domestic users. Mainland China has six of the world's top 10 container ports. 
The loss of ship information from Chinese waters could pose a major challenge to transparency in the maritime supply chain, aggravating an already strained global supply chain. From the U.S. side, the Trump administration has awakened many countries to long-standing problems that have been ignored, from the CCP's intellectual property theft to its broader non-compliance with the rules of the World Trade Organization. The situation hasn't reversed since President Biden took office, as anticipated by executives of Chinese and U.S. companies. Tariffs and bans on certain products remain in place. National security issues between the U.S. and China over technological sovereignty and technology will affect global supply chains for a long time and on a grander scale. On October 29th, CNBC reported the story of Ouster, a U.S.-based lidar sensing technology marker company that buys a lot of materials from China and also sells a lot of products there. According to Ouster's co-founder and chief technology officer, their products include dozens or hundreds of integrated components, and they need to secure access to all of them. He said that if we want to secure uninterrupted supply security, we need 10 companies in Arizona, like TSMC. The Taiwanese semiconductor manufacturing company, TSMC, produces almost all the world's most advanced chips, including many with sophisticated processes. These chips are found in billions of products with built-in electronic devices, including iPhones, personal computers, and cars. Over the past few years, TSMC has become the world's most important semiconductor company, with a huge impact on the global economy. With a market capitalization of approximately 550 billion U.S. dollars, the company ranks 11th on the global list of corporate market capitalization. Fritchell has also voiced concerns that, in addition to national security risks, the world's most advanced chip fabs are too geographically concentrated in the Asian region, and a single disaster could wipe them out. This concern is justified. Since unifying Taiwan is a dream of the CCP, a war to unify Taiwan is likely to be part of the CCP's scheme to deflect domestic crises, which seem to pop up everywhere, from the collapse of the real estate bubble to the declining population, from power shortage to the exodus of foreign capital. Recently, the U.S. media, Bloomberg, compiled a list of the eight biggest economic risks that may affect 2022. Based on Bloomberg's view, a geopolitical crisis in the Taiwan Strait could jeopardize global semiconductor production capacity. Any escalation between mainland China and Taiwan, from blockade to outright invasion, could draw in other world powers, including the U.S. A superpower war is the worst case, but scenarios short of that include sanctions that would freeze ties between the world's two biggest economies and a collapse in Taiwan's production of semiconductors, which are crucial to the global output of everything from smartphones to cars. The global supply chain involves many elements. Here, a few examples are shown to illustrate the risks of a supply chain that originates from Chinese production and assembly. For many companies around the world, getting out of this risky situation means no longer relying on the CCP. They might have to work together to stop the Communist Party that wants to plant its red flag all over the world. It won't be easy. Whether it's Southeast Asia or Mexico, these economies aren't as developed as China's. In Vietnam, for example, it may be necessary to build roads or pay for the expansion of the power and water grids to factories. Connectivity to ports may be problematic, and the technology within the ports won't be at the same level as in China. China's ports are efficient, have high throughput, and can accommodate the largest container ships. China also offers direct maritime services to markets around the world. It's still wise, though, for companies to consider moving manufacturing out of China early. In reality, to insulate themselves from future supply disruptions, many companies worldwide are adopting a China plus one strategy, moving at least some of their Chinese manufacturing facilities to Southeast Asia or India. It appears that leaving China has become a trend.